Right. Thank you very much, everyone. So, mastering visual communication. Actual effective visual communication is something that is really not given enough kind of emphasis in architecture and when we're taught things. So I'm just going to kind of scratch the surface of it today because I have 45 minutes and not sort of three days to talk to you about it. Um, but if you do want more, then I can tell you how to get some more later on. We're going to look at some patterns and anti-patterns to help explain all the different um, ideas and how to improve so you can avoid the pitfalls and improve your diagrams. So my first message, style actually communicates all by itself. If you look at these two, I think you can agree that although the difference is actually quite subtle, the one on the left is actually a lot less developed looking than the one on the right. So think about how we could use these. We can actually use this visual style to communicate to our audience. So let's have a look. This one, imagine that you showed a diagram like this to your product owner, kind of towards the beginning of a project, and they look at it and they go, oh, that's great. When are you going to start testing? And actually, because it looks a bit more developed, they've got the wrong idea. And so they're thinking that this all kind of exists already when, no, it really doesn't. But if you showed them something like that, they might get less of that idea. But then again, show that to your stakeholders later on, and what are they going to think? They're going to think, oh, we're, going, we're far behind. What's going on? So that's my first pattern, which is meta style, also known as using style to communicate. And you can use that style to your advantage to actually make, get your message across to your audience and avoid miscommunication, like with that product owner who thought everything was ready for testing. No, it's not. So a quick show of hands on this one. Which one of these styles would you use for this diagram? It's a data flow diagram, a level two one. So hands up if you would use the top one, number one, if you were uh, drawing this diagram. Few hands, okay, and number two? Definite preference for number two. And I think I'd go that way as well with this one. But it's this classic, it depends. So, I would probably use the second one, but wait a minute, what if we're just roughing out some ideas? Why not use number one then? But as it's got quite a lot of detail in it, we can use number two. And that leads us on to another pattern. This one's an anti-pattern, which is called multi-story diagram. And this is about mixing your levels of abstraction. So if you code, you probably know this is a bit of a sin in coding. You shouldn't mix your levels of abstraction. It's not going to go well. And separating your layers in abstraction applies to diagrams as well. It all gets a bit confusing if you don't. With your architecture levels. They're slightly different from what you get in coding. So here's two examples. On the left, we've got C4. So a lot of you might have known that one. So that one's contextual container component and code. And then some of you might have heard of the SABSA framework, which is a security architecture framework. And that one actually has five layers, contextual, conceptual, logical, physical, and component. But it's the same kind of thing. So we'll look at the C4 ones as they're explicitly about diagrams just to have a look at this. Now, if you have a diagram like this, it's just not quite right. And you kind of get that feeling, especially if you know C4. So if you think about with the, ooh, where is it? There it is. Uh -huh. So we've got this online shop in the middle, but look, it's writing to a queue and reading from a database, and there's just no more detail. So it's just not, doesn't gel this picture. So C4 is actually really good for helping us to um, uh, uh, keep these uh, different layers apart. So we've got the context diagram. This one's the highest level. And so in this one, this one's got the online shop, and it gives us all the detail of what the online shop 
connects with, how it interacts. So we have two uh, customers, we've got a customer and we've got an administrator, we've got information about how they interact, and then we've got some uh, systems which are external, the grey ones, and how it interacts with those. So that's that level. And then we've got a container diagram for the system as well. So this is one level down, and the blue system, the dark blue one from that one, is now this dotted line. It's got the same uh, label down here, but it just means that we've now got that separation of the different levels. And so on this one, this is where we got the transaction queue and the databases and things like that. And so it makes a lot more sense when we look at it. So mixing your levels of abstraction causes confusion. Let's try and avoid it because what's the point of a diagram to communicate? Now this is probably one of people's favorite patterns, this one, um, explosion of unicorns. I know this is one of Mark's favorite patterns. Um, so also known as too many colors. Um, so just one second. Okay. Um, <laughs> so we've got kind of one color for every single thing, and you don't really need a different color for every single thing. You also don't need to make them this bright. Uh, I'm sure you probably don't make diagrams like this, but it's a bit fun to explore it. And um, it's kind of a bit overwhelming, if you see what I mean. So. Um, seeing this has reminded me, I just wanted to warn everyone, never actually go and Google um, rainbow unicorn gif. You won't like what you see. So just don't do it, warning you. So yeah, overwhelm, right. I can take those off now. So I've dialed back the colors and I've actually used them to communicate instead. So in this case, I've grouped them by function. So we have the, uh, orange ones, let's see if I can get my thing back on. Right, so we've got the orange ones, and they are the sort of payment stuff. We've got purple for the address stuff, and then we've got this blue for the other one. You can do it more than one way. We can group by type. It depends what you're trying to communicate to your audience. So in this one, all my external systems are orange. And so we've just done it in a different way, but we've used the color to communicate and not to overwhelm. So first point, minimize your color palette. You don't need a different color for every single thing. And you can actually use your color to aid your communication, like visual grouping. Another anti-pattern, this one's called spider's web, also known as unclear relationships. And I bet you have definitely seen this one. When you get something like this, where you've got lines all over the place. You've got labels that you think, which line is that actually a label for? And you look at it and you think, okay, I think I'm gonna to have to ask someone about this one, which is not what you want your audience to think when they look at your diagram. Little spider there in its web. So, first point, minimize lines, crossing. And one way to do that is just to move bits around, play about with it, and use obvious line jumps. Most software actually allows you to set that up, and even, I mean, even things like diagrams.net, the draw.io, which is free, allows you to change the size of your line jumps, so you can make them really obvious. Uh, another way to do that is to standardize the position of the label, so with that um, spider's web that we saw a few minutes ago, the labels were all over the place, it wasn't clear which line they applied to. And so if you standardize that position, say at the beginning of the arrow, in the middle of the arrow, wherever it looks best, then it would be much easier for people to just visually see where and which, diagram you are, or which line you are uh, labeling. Um, and using angled lines rather than just the straight ones is gonna really help you as well. So let's have a look. Now we've got so the two different diagrams, I've just sort of put them on the same slide so you can kind of see the difference. And you can see in this one that I've used the straight lines. That's an actual setting in most uh, diagramming software. Diagrams.net, this was made in. So completely free. 
Um, and so with these labels, I've standardized them to the beginning of the arrow, or if you've got a short arrow, like those ones there, it's in the middle, or if it doesn't fit, put it somewhere slightly sensible. So just make it clear, apply these rules one after the other and it will make it clear. So let's have a quick look at the big picture. And now we can see that we've created a diagram where you don't think, oh, I'm gonna to have to ask somebody which label is for which line. Uh, one other thing you can do with diagrams like this is to actually split them out. So if I thought, right, what I'm trying to communicate here has got nothing to do with that analytics, and that analytics is connected to everything. Take it out, create an analytics diagram instead, and that analytics diagram maybe doesn't include all this stuff, and so that makes the analytics diagram clearer. Nice and simple. Diagrams are free. Neil Ford likes to say this about his and um, Nate Shooter's cookie cutter pattern, which they have for presentations, and he says slides are free meaning you don't have to cram everything into one slide or fit it exactly to the slide. So diagrams are free as well. And you may say, well, wait a minute, it takes time to create another diagram, but actually it takes a lot of time to try and cram everything into just one diagram. And then it takes time to explain that diagram to everyone because it's not clear. And then it takes time to sort things out because people didn't understand things properly and stuff got into production, like we talked about earlier. Right, another anti-pattern, colour is key. Also known as relying on colour to communicate. And this is an interesting one. Another little bit of interaction here on the show of hands. This is being simulated to show pronotopia, which is a type of colour blindness. So if you had this, this is what you would see. Now there's actually four different colours here, but can you tell me which one is yellow? So how many people think A is yellow? B? C? And D? You actually all got it right in that case. But can you see that there is confusion there? And if you didn't know that only one was yellow, how about now? This is a different type of color blindness. This one's simulated tritinopia. And I've modelled them up again, so it's not just going to be the one on the right. <laughs> so, which one of these is yellow? Is it E? F? G? Or H? Most people did not put their hand up at all. <laughs> That's cheating. <laughs> so in this case, it's E, is the yellow one. So, if you have a look at here, we've got the standard colours in the middle and then the simulated ones in the top and bottom. So, there's a confusion between the yellow and the orange. You can't really tell much between them. And you say, oh, okay, I'll just use the green then. What about people with protonopia? If you said, which one of these is green? They're not going to be able to tell you. So... Lots of different types of colour blindness, or colour vision deficiency, as it's technically called. And you probably didn't know that there are all these different types. And it's all to do with whether you have a weakness in a particular colour, or cannot see it at all. There's also one called achromatopsia, or monochromacy, which is where you can't actually see colour at all. And it's the most rare version. But approximately 4.5% of the world's population has a form of colour vision deficiency. And you may think, well, that's quite a small number. But actually, I think in the technical world, it's actually probably a qu quite a lot higher. I did a course online the other week, and I asked people, and it was 5.3% of the people who attended that course. And you may think, OK, this is not that many people. Why should I bother? Still a very small number. But that's what inclusion is all about. And you do not want to risk your communication. If one of your key stakeholders is colorblind and you don't know, it's actually one in 12 men and one in 200 women. And the reason that's it's quite a difference is because it's hereditary and it's to do with the X chromosome. 
And so a woman has to actually inherit two 40X chromosomes, women having two X, men having an X and a Y. That is actually more than 350 million people worldwide, which is more than the population of the USA, which is about 330 million, and it's about seven and a half times the population of the whole of Spain who have color vision deficiency worldwide. But we're not alone. There are tools out there. There are actually free ones that you can just use in your browser. So if you actually develop for the web, these are very useful. So this is just an example using some pictures uh, which I searched for, and you can actually simulate the different types of color blindness. So let's go through the process. Here's a palette I created. I just pulled these colors out of a picture that I quite liked. I thought, oh, that looks nice. Quite like that. Then I've simulated it. And what you need to do is you need to look at these vertical lines to check that people can actually tell the difference between the different colors. So if we look at some of these, there's not much difference, if any, between some of them. So how can we sort that out? It's actually fairly simple. Just take one of the blues out. And you may say, well, wait a minute, this is my um, official color palette. I can't just do that. But maybe you can split it so that people don't use both blues together. So maybe you could make one palette like that, make a second palette with the other blue in. Maybe you can change the luminosity of one of the blues, but then you're going to have to check that it then doesn't collide with any of the others. And the other thing I've looked at on here, if you look on, the, um, on your left, is the low contrast. And that is so we can start thinking about, actually, what happens if I put something on a screen like this? How's the projector calibrated? How's that other person's monitor calibrated? If you have subtle differences in color, they might not show up. So the trick is just not to rely on color alone. If you want effective communication, you are going to need to use more than just color. So thinking about my diagram that I used earlier, that was a standard colors from diagrams.net. But if I simulate deuteranopia, which is another form, then that's not three colors anymore, that's two. You cannot tell the difference between the purple and the blue. So how about using the one, the uh, palette that I created? If you look at that, it's not the same colors. We're not going to be able to simulate the same colors. People who are colorblind cannot see them. But we can make it so that people can tell the difference between the colors. The other thing to do is not to say, so the red one here. <laughs> and then you will be able to communicate a lot better. So top tips, use a colorblind simulator. They're a lot, there's a lot of free ones that you can download. They're quite simple. And once you do have that palette, and you know it's colorblind friendly, then you're good to go. So how about this one? Blue and green, that's all right. We have this red-green colorblindness, this blue-yellow colorblindness. This one's going to be fine, isn't it? What about grayscale? So I mentioned about monitor calibration. What if somebody prints it out? I know people don't tend to print things at the moment, but at the moment I'm writing a book for O'Reilly and it's going to be about this. And they're going to print it in black and white. Ebook will be fine, but I've got to do this for every single one of my diagrams and make sure that it looks all right just in grayscale. So one thing you can do, use pattern if you're not going to change the colors, if you're not allowed to change the colors. So all I've done here is added pattern to one of them. And I've used a decent amount of contrast with the pattern. And now we can see which one's cats and which one's dogs. I don't know what side you're on, but I'm not going to tell you what side I'm on either. Um, another thing you can do is use symbols. So you might have noticed throughout this, whenever I've been looking at pattern or something that works well, I've been using ticks, no green. And when I've been looking at an anti-pattern, there's been crosses. No need for color at all in that case. And so here's a takeaway question for you. Is the pattern, is the palette in your software or that your company uses 
colorblind friendly. I won't call it homework because you might not do it then, but um, have a think about it. Try it with one of the coming blind simulators. It's actually quite fun. Right, now we have written in legend, also known as use a key or a legend. You can't rely on your audience having specific knowledge. You don't know who your diagrams will be shared with, so even if you know, oh, this diagram's only for my team, they all know UML or whatever, then it gets passed on to someone else and they don't understand it. It's always a balancing act. You're never going to really be able to please everyone, but there's a few things you can do to try and get it right. It's all about kind of putting guides in place for those people who need them. And a good analogy to this, a good metaphor, is ramps and steps. So if you look in this picture, we've got a ramp which goes up. And so anyone who needs the ramp to get to where they need to go, it's there for them. But the steps are still there. So anyone who thinks, oh, the steps are going to be quicker for me, can still use the steps. So it's kind of getting that balance right to try to please everyone. So I picked these lovely icons. They all represent different things. And it's obvious, isn't it? That's why I picked them. Don't rely on that. Give yourself a key. Make it explicit. Now, if you've not used domain storytelling before, I can highly recommend looking into it. But the whole point of it is making sure that business and technical teams actually understand each other. So if you're going to go to all the trouble of trying to do that, put a key in. Make sure that people really do understand each other. Don't leave it open to interpretation. So UML, everyone knows UML, right? Well, not really these days. And it has an awful lot of eccentricities in it. Little odd things. So putting your key in, just to remind people that actually, you know, the arrow going up, yeah, that means that the, that's the parent and that's the child and it's not the other way around and it's all inheritance and things like that. So just give people a reminder. But maybe you're thinking now, oh, okay, there's a lot of information on this page now. How about just make it so that people can click through to it? So if this is something that people are navigating themselves, those people who want to use the ramp can use the ramp, and those people who want to take the stairs can take the stairs. This is a big tip in all architecture. Limit your assumptions. And if you are making assumptions, write them down, get them ticked off by all your stakeholders. But if you limit your assumptions when you're make, creating diagrams, this is going to be going to help you. Right, another good anti-pattern, this one. It's called MLAH, which stands for Multiple Letter Acronym HELL. How many times have you been in a meeting or read something and you thought, I think I know what that means? I'm really not sure, though. That acronym that someone said, and you just think, OK. I'm just going to guess. I'm not going to look like a fool and ask. It's actually one of the things I really like about online meetings now, where you can just subtly in the chat just go, what does that mean? <laughs> what does that acronym mean? And someone will just answer you, and you don't have to stop the flow of the meeting. And I bet there's at least five other people in the meeting who are going, oh, thank goodness somebody asked. So only use defined acronyms. Maybe you've defined them in a key, maybe in a glossary, maybe the first time you use it, but only use defined acronyms. Just do not assume. So, a little bit more fun. If you know what these acronyms are, I'd like you to call out. So what's this one? Don't repeat yourself. Okay. DFD. You're going to have to shout. Data flow diagram, well done. SPA, single page application. BLT, yep, bacon, lettuce, and tomato. Or is it business leadership team? 
Is it a basic language translator? Bulk loading tool. Be like that. You see what I mean? Acronyms can mean different things to different people. Bacon, lettuce, and tomato, you're much more likely to think of that than any of those other ones. It's actually very easy to fall into thinking that other people have the same understanding as you. You live in your own brain. Fairly obvious. Unfortunately, other people don't. And so you have to try and remember to, that you need to communicate with other people. So you know what the acronym means, or at least I hope you do. And your colleagues who you interact with every day, they know what the acronym means, or at least they pretend they know what the acronym means. So you just need to think about, does my audience know? Just assume no, they don't. So next time you see an next time you use an acronym, think SIDI. State it, define it. Okay, I'm being really silly making up an acronym for this, but I did just follow it. Stated it, defined it. Right, another pattern. A push in the right direction. This one's about matching the flow of your diagram to your audience's expectations. But all diagrams actually have a flow of information, whether they're a structural diagram or a data flow diagram, anything like that. So when this one was made, there was just no care as to how someone was actually going to read it. But if you look at this one, we've got, this is the sort of start down here on the bottom right. Where do we start reading in English? Top left. And we read left to right, don't we? This one, everything's just going right to left, and it's going bottom to top. There was just no thought as to how someone was actually going to read this diagram when it was created. So let's match expectations. Now we've got the start of the diagram is on the left. We have things moving from the left to the right. In fact, we have data going into the system going left to right. We have data coming out of the system going from right to left. This is an accepted expectation. People just know that this happens. When we're using sequence diagrams, it's just kind of the way things are done. So you can think of them to kind of help you with this. We've got all our flow going from the left to the right and then from the right to the left. It's a bit harder to get sequence diagrams wrong. But you can end up getting all these bits at the top in the wrong order. So have a think about that with your sequence diagrams. The big thing is to consider how your audience is going to read your diagram when they actually get hold of it. And ha if actually talking through it to somebody can help you with that, because if you're going all over the place and it feels unnatural, then that's going to be a big hint. Right, another pattern. Show them the pirate ship. This is actually named after a chapter in Gregor Hope's book, uh, The Software Architect Elevator, which is another recommendation I've got. And this is all about enthralling your audience with the big picture, rather than starting with the detail. So Gregor actually uses Legos, or if you're from the UK, Lego, I don't know what it is on the continent, uh, to describe this. And so he says, when you look at the cover of a box of Legos, you don't see a picture of each individual brick that's inside. Instead, you see the picture of an exciting, fully assembled model positioned in a lifelike pirate's bay with cliffs and sharks. And you can get his point. We're not, no, we're not creating diagrams for children, but we're creating diagrams for people. So think about first impressions. When it comes to things like data flow diagrams, this one, I've used this one before, it's a level two diagram. We just kind of know, yeah, that's not where I'm going to start. That's fairly obvious. Don't start with the detail. You start with your top level. So with the DFDs, with the data flow diagrams, there you go, I defined it. We are, it's fairly obvious. So we start with the top and then we go down. But what about other types of diagram? And are we really gonna start with your data flow diagrams? 
even if you're actually talking about the data, it's not a good place to start. Let's go for the big picture, go for context. C4, really good way to do this. You can use other types, up to you, as long as it's sort of big picture telling me what's going on. What's the landscape? How is my system, this online shop, interacting with the environment? How is the environment interacting with it? The other thing you can think of, if you're not looking explicitly just at diagrams, is you can think about sort of why is this for the biz uh, good for the business? What are the benefits? What are the drivers for this as well? And then you can use your diagrams to create a narrative. So we start from the context, number one. You can go down a level into the containers. And then here's the bit we actually wanted to talk about, the data flow. But we've given that context. We've got people interested in a diagram, which can be hard to do. The other tip I have is to fill in the narrative gaps. So take all the diagrams you have in your project and put them in a narrative flow. And you will probably find that there's some gaps somewhere. Fill them in now before you're kind of in front of a live audience or something, and then you end up falling into that gap. So go and do that first. And now another anti-pattern. Not so unified modeling language. OK, I want to do a quick poll here. Hands up. How many people use UML in their day-to-day -day work? That's not many. <laughs> and as I thought. <laughs> so this is all about using UML when it's not useful. I'm glad a lot of you aren't using it. So. But UML actually is useful. I'm not saying it's not useful. But it's useful in the right context. So UML diagrams are actually split into two different types, structural and behavioral. And there are an awful lot of different types of UML diagram. And I bet there's no one here who's actually used all of them. I bet. So there's only actually a few of them that are really used in anger. Sort of the class and component, and then like sequence. I, I often use a type of sequence diagram. And then use cases and activity diagrams. You need to think about what does your audience actually need? What level of detail do they need? Do they want technical detail? Do they want business detail? If it's business, you probably don't want UML. And the other side of this is something that's quite often neglected. What do you actually need from your audience? What do you need them to understand to get back from them what you need? Do you need them to sign off on something? Do you need them to actually make a decision? Have a think about that as well. Now, here's a UML component diagram. I've actually only ever made one UML component diagram, and that's this one for this slide. So that shows how often they're used. But who is this really useful for? It's got a lot of technical detail in it, which you might not even be able to read. Why would we make a diagram like this? Keep it simple and straightforward. You want people to actually understand something from your diagram. How can I communicate this in a better way, in a more simplified way? I've gone back to C4 again, but it's just a nice, easy way to communicate with people. For that previous diagram, most people would have needed a key, probably some kind of explanation. This one, you can get away without a key, although I just told you to include a key. So include the key, but you could get away with it. And so this actually shows exactly the same information as that previous picture. And this time, technical audiences would find that useful. Business audiences also understand it. And so you could kind of done a two-for-one diagram there. Yeah, as I said, understood by business, useful to technical audiences as well. How about a UML sequence diagram? I said I actually use these, but you can go to, into too much detail with these. These have actually got their own, their own little method names in there. That's getting a little bit into the details for me. If you really, really, really need 
documentation of what your methods are, then you're going to, you want to auto-generate it because that changes all the time. How long until it's going to be out of date? It's probably out of date in the time that I've been talking. So let's have a simplified sequence diagram. I've taken out the method names. All, I've also actually split it into more than one. The, this is part two of three. So again, as I was saying before, don't try and fit everything into one diagram. But with these, this series of three diagrams, I've communicated exactly the same thing, and it's not going to go out of date. A developer could use that to then implement code, or if they wanted to document the code, they could create that. Useful for everybody. So if you're going to use UML, use it for good reason. Your audience needs to understand it. Another anti-pattern. I've got quite a lot of anti-patterns, actually. And this one's called structures behaving badly, also known as mixing structure and behavior. So with UML, I talked about the fact that it's split into structure and behavior, and there is a logic behind that. Having structure and behavior in one diagram is very confusing. There's just too much information in that diagram. And here's just a sort of, it's a non-standard notation. And it's including a lot of information in here. We've got arrows going backwards and forwards, showing kind of the data flow in both directions. We've got kind of logical or conceptual ideas of where things are. There's a lot of boxes. What is that diagram really trying to achieve? And the answer here isn't it depends. It's too much. So let's split it out. Here I've got a structure, again, just a non-standard notation, but it makes sense. This is now just got one reason for having this diagram. It's a conceptual structural diagram, and we can see the information that we're trying to communicate here. And then we can split it out into some kind of behavior. Maybe you need a sequence diagram for this. In this case, it was data, so I've put it into a data flow diagram. And this one, again, one reason for existence. It's showing us the data flow and the behavior. So we can apply the single, response, uh, single responsibility principle to our diagrams as well as our code. Although we did get that two for one before. It's not always cut and dried, is it? Right, now we have a pattern. This one's called connect the dots. And this one, I talked about the different levels of abstraction before. This one is about connecting those different levels of abstraction together so that you get the understanding from your audience. So navigating between the different levels of abstraction must be easy. People aren't going to make the effort to do something. Or if they do, they're going to resent it. And you don't want your audience resenting you. You're probably not going to get what you want. So when we look up C4, it actually has a built-in method for doing this. So we've got our online shop in both diagrams, but in one, it's shown as the center, and it's the dark blue, and then the next one, we've got it as the dotted line. And so that gives us that link. And so C4 is quite good with this. It actually has it built in. Even data flow diagrams depending on what notation you're using, have this built in as well. And so we can use numbers and letters in this case. So we've got two different levels here, of data flow diagram, but the numbers help us match them together. So we can see that number two on the first diagram, I mean, that's, it's fairly obvious that it relates to 2.1, 2.2, and 2.3 in the second diagram. Nice and easy to link there. We've also got the letters which tell us all the different data stores. And so we can see that these two data stores in the second one are also in the first diagram. And we can make that link. It's nice and easy. You need to make explicit references to other levels of abstraction. And if they don't exist, you're going to have to create something. You can do something like this. This one does take up a bit of space. It does 
kind of go against the dry principle because I've recreated part of another diagram, but at least I've put that link in there. Another better way to do this would be to kind of combine the two and sort of think, oh, C4, that uses a good way of doing this. So whatever the diagram, I can now put that dotted line in and I now know, oh, that's number two on a different diagram. I can go and find that diagram now. Right, this is going to be my last pattern for today. It's called strike balance. And I call this strike balance because it's all about kind of creating that. It's not just visual balance. And I'll show you this. So kind of visual balance is kind of important in all design, not just in photography, like this kind of diagram. A good quote here, balance is an innate fundamental human expectation. So your audiences like balance. So you want to get something from them, you want to make them happy. Here's another way to do it. It's not all about symmetry. And if you want a bit more information, you'll have to look out for my book next year. But let's have a look. We're going to look at symmetry with this one. This is a totally legitimate C4 diagram. It's a container one. But it's just a little bit kind of, you know, I'm not too sure about this. That's a bit more satisfying. And I've actually balanced it in two different ways. So I've balanced it visually, but I've also balanced the content. So with use that one, on this side, I've actually now got all the kind of transactional bits that are all to do with the customer. And on this side, I've got all the more sort of static bits, which are sort of more on the administrator side. And so that's kind of given that sort of separation of content as well as the actual visual balance. The other thing which might make people like this is it looks a bit like a space invader. Um, but I suppose it depends if you like space invaders or not. But the important thing to remember is you should not sacrifice the clarity of your message to balance it. So it might look really pretty, but if people don't understand it, then you've just gone too far. So we can use the visual and the content balance to enhance the clarity and just help our audiences to understand and you know, make them a bit happier. So a bit of a summary. We've gone through 13 different patterns and anti-patterns today. You may not have realized how many we did. So we have meta style. So now you can use this so that you can think about how the style of your image is going to communicate things, possibly even subconsciously, to your audience. Multi-story diagram. Don't mix the levels of your diagrams. It just causes confusion. Explosion of unicorns. Don't make me put my sunglasses back on. Spider's web. I want to know where these, all these lines are going to. If they're crossing too much, if I don't know which label it is, then I'm going to have to ask questions, and I don't want to do that as your audience. Colour is key. Don't think that everybody sees the image in the same way as you. Written in legend, I just say, be a legend and include one. M-L-A-H. Anyone remember what it actually meant? <laughs> Multiple letter acronym HELL. State it and define it. I push in the right direction. Get the flow of your diagram to go with people's expectations. If you're actually writing something in a language that reads right to left, maybe you, you actually want to think about your diagrams going right to left. Maybe ask your audience about that. Show them the pirate ship. We're down in the nitty gritty details. We need to come out from under the sea into the pirate bay and actually show people why we're doing this. Not so unified modeling language. Use UML when you need to and don't use it when you don't need to because people will not understand. Structures behaving badly, make sure that your structure and your behavior are not in the same diagram. It just causes severe confusion. Connect the dots. 
this was connecting all your levels of abstraction. Make sure that people don't have to fight to find information in your diagrams. And then strike a balance. Add some polish to your diagram. Balance it visually. Try and balance the content as well. You're going to make people a lot happier. I couldn't resist putting a little quote in from Mark and Neil. Everything in software architecture is a trade-off, and that's their first law of software architecture. But I'm going to do my own. I'm going to say everything in visual architecture is a trade-off as well. So I want to say thank you to the sponsors as well, but thank you to everyone here for coming to my talk. And I'm very happy to answer questions right now, or I'm going to be in the Q&A later, and you can always get in contact with me at my, by my website. So thank you very much. OK, um, we have several online questions. <clears throat> so the first one. In our organization, we have for about 80 systems, which more or less are connected to each other. And when we created the diagram with the structurizer, uh, we found it that the context layer of the diagram is almost unreadable. What can we do to improve visibility? Okay, so Structurizer, for anyone who doesn't know it, is um, a way of creating C4 diagrams using code. And so that would be a nice, simple way of creating a diagram. But if you end up with this diagram with just loads and loads of information on it, then the way I would really tackle that is to think, why am I creating this diagram? Do I just want a picture of everything? I mean, why do you actually need that? So I would think, right, I want to create a diagram for a reason. And so I'd think, right, I want to see everything in my system to do with this. And so you actually just create the bit that you need. So you might want to know what everything that's connected to a particular service. And so you just create that bit. You don't need to show absolutely everything. I mean, if you have, was it 300 um, in that question? Uh, it was uh, 80. 80 systems. Oh, 80. But even if you've got 80 systems, you don't really need a diagram of all of them. There are different types of diagrams that you can use that might be more useful, like some of the ones that we've seen. But if you're creating a C4, I would say just don't create one with 80 systems on it because it's not actually going to... How are you going to use it, even if, it, even if you could see all the lines? What's the point? Mm -hmm. um, next question is, um, what is your opinion about handmade uh, VS auto-generated diagrams as code? Auto-generated diagrams. So they can be useful. But a lot of the time when you're generating diagrams from code, you've got to again think, why am I actually doing this? Is it just so I can go, oh, look, that's my diagram of the code, because that's pretty useless. If you're generating documentation from code, it's probably going to be things like APIs, because you want people to be able to access your API. So again, it's just thinking about, what do I actually really need this diagram for? And so, do I really need to generate it? Mm -hmm. um, how about using notations and colors suggested by architecture, model, and language like Archimate? Sorry, can you repeat the bit? Yeah, uh, how about using notations and colors suggested by architecture, model, and language like Archimate? Um, yes, yeah, so Archimate is a very useful one if you want to. Um, instead of using color, if you want to use sort of patterns and symbols and things. So if you have a look at Archimate, it's got every single type of relationship is like a different type of arrow. And this is actually in one of my other patterns, which I didn't have time for today. But it's, it's very useful for communicating without using color. The problem is that you really are going to need a key because I mean, I don't know, I can't remember how many different t types of arrows are, there are, but I think there's at least 10 different types of arrows in there. And that's more than the, the uh, plus or minus two of seven, just to keep the different types of relationship in your head. 
So you're definitely going to need a key for that. And if you do use any particular colour scheme, my advice is just to actually try it with one of these colour simulators. They are free. You can get ones to install on your computer as well. So just give it a go.